we want to hear the stories from the courses that you've taught. Whether in a lab, a classroom, kitchen, on Zoom, or in a shop. Drawing on your expertise, we'll ask the probing questions. What goes right and what goes wrong when teaching your favorite lesson? Hello, everybody, and welcome back to My Favorite Lesson, a podcast hosted by Teaching and Learning at Conestoga College. I am Dr. Lauren Spring, and today I am fortunate to be sitting here with Randall Kozak, who is a professor and coordinator of the Computer Applications Development and IT Innovation and Design Programs and Digital Solutions Management. That is a long title, Randall. It is indeed. Yes, we like, we like long names for our programs in the School of Computer Science. Well, you certainly do a lot at Conestoga, and I'm so grateful that you're here today. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much for having me. This is a real honor. Hmm. Well, let's get into it. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what brought you to Conestoga? All right. So I have been teaching at Conestoga for a little over 20 years now. Wow. And um, I have been teaching, actually, before that, I taught at a private college and at what was then called Ryerson University. So I actually started out teaching engineering courses Hmm. and, um, you know, taught things to do with automation, to do with uh, management science, and to do with design. And over time, I migrated more into really computer-specific topics. But a lot of the interest in, in management science and in design has been carried over from those engineering days. Wow. And do you find so as you migrated towards computers, what was it that initially sparked that interest and what's held what's held the interest for you over the years? Well, that's, um, you know, that's an interesting question. So my background going way back was really robotics and automation. So it was computer based in a way, but very much related to to hardware, to machinery, uh, manufacturing, that kind of thing. And over time, and that's why I ended up teaching at Ryerson various engineering and industrial engineering courses. Um, but what I found over time, as I had the opportunity to teach more computer science courses and that kind of thing, I found that the robotics courses didn't, um, didn't hold the, the same kind of interest for me uh, personally as did a lot of the computer science courses. And I think a lot of this had to do with the way the market was changed. So pardon me, was changing at that time. So at that time, we started to see a lot of changes in computer technology, mobile devices, animation, video mm-hmm. sound, you know, fancy websites, that kind of thing. There was a lot of excitement for me in those topics. As it turned out, you know, lots happened in robotics and automation. So for our people who work in that field, I think that they're probably enjoying it quite a lot. <laughs> but, but for me, I think a lot of it had to do with the time when I was making that migration and it was just opening up all kinds of opportunities in that field. And a lot of those opportunities aligned with uh, interests that I'd had for quite a long time. Neat. Okay. And so, yeah, you're saying these big changes were happening, I guess, this is 25, 30-ish years ago, if you've been at Conestoga the, for 20? Yeah. So we started to see a lot of the effect of that 15 to 20 years ago. Mm. So started to see more complicated websites ones that involved more elaborate design, animation, sound, and um, and mobile devices at that time. Right. So, yeah, there was a lot going on. Okay. And then what eventually led you towards Conestoga? Um, well, Conestoga was a, a place that I'd actually set my, my sights on earlier because I was living in Toronto. Toronto is a great city, but I always wanted to get out of Toronto. <laughs> I grew up in Toronto. I, I was commuting on the 401 every day. And, you know, in, in my mind, there was this vision of moving out to a smaller city somewhere, someplace that was a little bit more rural or at least had more of a rural setting. Okay. And uh, Conestoga was actually, um, there's one other college I had in mind, and Conestoga were my two uh primary targets. You know, I thought Conestoga had absolutely everything 
that I wanted. And as it turned out, and I knew this as well at the time, you know, there's this incredible culture around here to do with high tech industry and innovation, that kind of thing, which is fed beautifully into our computer science programs. Mm -hmm. So there was a whole lot that came together in Conestoga that made it an attractive uh, place for me to, to, to teach. Wonderful. And yeah. so what, so you've been with the college 20 years, which is quite phenomenal. What sort of changes would you say you've seen over time, either with the courses being offered or the knowledge that students are coming in with or, or want to graduate with? Um, the, the changes are huge. So when I started, we were at the Dune campus, which I loved. It's mm -hmm. got the pond, it's got the woods. That is nice. And, but at that time, we really had, I think, only one program with maybe a couple of sections or something. But very shortly around that time, two other programs came online in that field. We were not a separate school of applied computer science at that time. We belonged originally to the business school. So um, it was truly more of a rural setting at that time. Mm. The numbers were smaller. Dune was not that busy a place. KW was not that busy a place right. at that time. So over time, what we saw was a, a greater demand for our programs, partly because of the culture that was happening in KW. Um, obviously, the impact of international students has been huge on multiple levels. So not only did it increase enrollment, but it really changed the culture in a very positive way. Um, you know, we always had wonderful students at Conestoga, but now we had more of them and we had different kinds of students. Mm. And that led to a very interesting kind of environment in which to teach. Ultimately, we ended up moving to the Waterloo campus a few years ago, and there are, there are a lot of renovations that were done to that campus to accommodate us when we moved there. So that's a beautiful campus. It's very elegant. It fits in beautifully with the culture of high tech. Hmm. Um, and then, as I said, the field itself of computer science has really changed quite radically over that time. So lots and lots of changes, all very interesting, all very stimulating. You never know what's going to hit you at any given time. And so students who come into the program now, what sorts of careers do you think they, they envision for themselves post Conestoga? Well... The breadth of, of positions that are available to graduates from this field is wider than it's ever been before. Mm -hmm. And that's also reflected in the interests of the students coming into these programs. So at one time, what we had was the computer programming, sorry, at that time it was called the Computer Programmer Analyst Program. It became Computer Programming and Analysis a few years ago. That is a program that goes right back to the, to the roots of the Ontario college system. That really revolved around business level programming. So programming business applications, usually in the context of larger companies. Uh, students who came into that program would anticipate becoming programmers, mm -hmm. pri primarily or coders, and that there would be a career path for them where they could become what are called systems analysts. Those are more senior positions and IT managers. And a number of the students from who graduated from the program in those days did, in fact, go through that kind of a career path. A lot of them became successful managers in the area. Um, but now, as I said, we have all kinds of other stuff that's connected to business systems. Mm -hmm. So there's e-commerce, there are complicated websites with other kind of features I mentioned before. And um, there's a greater need now for infrastructure, so uh, putting in place computer systems that will allow business software to run. So we get students coming into our programs who are interested not only in programming, but in design, mm. they might have interests in animation and that kind of thing. We have students who are interested in big data, in mm. artificial intelligence. So not only have our program, uh, has our program set grown to accommodate greater needs across industry, 
but the students coming in are aware of these kinds of uh, roles that they might be able to achieve if they go through our programs. And, and we have different programs that, that address some of those more than others, naturally. But students are able to pick out the program that they want, that will address what they, they believe that they're interested in. Or, you know, in the case of mature students, they often know exactly what they want. Mm. In the case of students who are coming to us from high school, they might not be so sure at that point, but they have a chance to come into our programs, get to know a little bit about them if they want to move from one program to another. That's all possible. Mm, that's a nice that's a nice option to be able to explore. <laughs> it, it is. It is. You know, there are so much there's so much more in the way of opportunity now, I think, in post-secondary education than you had at one time. And you had mentioned, too, you know, throughout your time at Conestoga, seeing a much bigger influx, influx of international students mm -hmm. and the benefits that this brings to the college and your program. Have you know, I mean, I suppose when I think about, um, you know, computers and technical skills, uh, it seems, you know, not necessarily as interpersonal as other as other domains might be. But at the same time, I imagine pedagogically that that likely inspired some shifts in your teaching. Are there things in particular that you noted um, that you've done differently since uh, having so many international students in the classroom? Well, uh, I think so. So different, I think uh, educational systems in different, in different countries tend to have different um, areas that they focus on. And... In the courses that I teach, there's usually a strong research component, a strong reporting component. So there's usually technical reports that are involved. And, you know, you just don't know what the background of any given student is going to be. The students might be very good in certain areas, but they might be lacking certain things. And that's an area that I think is not addressed uniformly around the world. Um, I think in certain in certain regions, there is um, you know uh, there's a, a notion of rigor that has to do with very much standardized tests mm -hmm. and learning particular skills because they're very concerned about evaluating those, and I get that completely. But then for courses that I teach. There are kind of fuzzy topics, like mm -hmm. I said, that require research, that require critical thinking. Those things are harder to evaluate in right. certain circumstances. And so certain students might not be as well prepared for those. And so we have to create the assignments in such a way that steps them through it. We have to provide resources that will help them to understand those things. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I would mention. Interesting. Yeah. And it seems like a lot of those things that you listed, you know, whether it's animation or design or kind of user experience um, would require quite a bit of creative thinking or maybe, you know, trial and error. And you, you might do something wrong and learn, learn from that and then adjust. And that's not a comfortable way of learning for everyone. right? That is a great point. And what a great way to point to put it. I've never quite thought of it that way. But I think you're absolutely right. I think in some cultures, the idea of doing something wrong and then doing it again really might be very unpleasant for them. And, and for us, especially in the field of IT and computer science, iterative design, iterative development is so important. Yeah, and those mistakes, I guess, are, are celebrated, right? That it's, yep. you've learned something here. and uh... Well, and you hear about it all the time. So Silicon Valley has any number of gurus who will tell um, aspiring innovators to fail well and fail mm -hmm. better and that kind of thing. So it's actually become kind of a business thing nowadays. It's talked about a lot. And people might have different comfort levels with respect to it, just as you say, but they need to understand that kind of culture, that kind of mentality as well. Because if you go and work in a, certainly in a startup in Silicon Valley, and I suspect it would be true of the startups in KW, mm -hmm. people are going to be talking about exactly those things. Okay, we've got to fail well. We've got to manage our risk. Yes, we can try something. And if it doesn't work out, that's okay. But we've got to have an escape plan or we have to know how to do it better next time. 
So these are these are new ideas for many of us, not not just from for certain international students, but I think we're all struggling with these things. Yeah. Yeah, that's so rich. And I mean, it's fascinating that word risk, because I see how that's built into the culture of, of <laughs> kind of tech innovation. And um, and yet, you know, when we think of international students already taking huge risks, right, coming here and and the stakes are extra high that I can understand why there might be some resistance to get it wrong in the classroom or, or have that perception at least. An interesting point, an interesting point. Yeah. So they have a real challenge ahead of them. You know, they jump on a plane, they come halfway around the world. They've obviously spent a lot of money to do that. They get off uh, They get off the plane sometimes. Their trips are delayed as a result of, of, of visa considerations and that kind of thing. Sometimes they're getting off the plane, they're coming straight to class. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> Thank goodness. You want it to be a welcoming place in that case. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All the time, but especially... So it's easy to understand how they might have, uh, they might be a little bit uh, less risk averse than others. Yeah. So let's get into some details, Randall. You um, wanted to share a lesson with us today from a course you've taught several times, I believe, about user experience. Yes. All right. Tell us about it. Okay. So the user experience course is a course I'm very fond of. Uh, I've been teaching it for a number of years now. It's evolved quite a bit for a number of different reasons. Uh, It used to be a more senior level course at one time. It got moved into the first level of of three programs. So the computer programming and analysis program, the computer program, the IT innovation and design program. Hmm. So we were just talking a little bit about the way computer science has been taught traditionally and the new wrinkles that have been introduced to it. And this, I think, is one all by itself. So this is a course that involves design of software. We get students working in teams. There's a lot of creativity involved. There's a lot of brainstorming. Mm. And so a lot of these are skills that these students are not necessarily going to be familiar with. Okay. And there's a lot of adjustment there. We try to bring them along quite gently. And it's not a hard course by any means, but these are all new ideas, so we need to bring them along. Um, Like I said, it used to be a more senior level course. We moved into first level for a couple of reasons. We had a chair. uh, We were doing an NPR, major program review, for one of the three programs involved. That program has a strong design stream. And so the chair had a really good idea and said, you know what, you need to move this earlier on Mm -hmm. in that program. And so we we moved it up in all three of those programs because they all needed some kind of a course like that. And um, the other thing that it's done for us is, like I said, it's introduced the students to teamwork and, you know, taking the responsibility for a team to generate a technical report mm. that documents their designs and their deliberations around the design and to make sure that that gets uploaded. And so that's all a little bit different than most, but not all of the other courses that they're getting at the same time. At the same time, they are getting courses in coding, okay. uh, course in programming, and a course in, in HTML and web development. So this is rather different from those, although, you know, let's make no mistake about it, they, they involve some creativity as well. Um, but then they're also getting the college reading and writing course at the same time. And this course actually shares some commonalities with that course to do with writing technical reports, and reporting, because reporting on a design that they develop is a very important outcome for that course. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Now, the course is called User Experience. The course has to do with designing software and websites. Um, At one time, that would have been called UI design, user interface design. At some point 20, 30 years ago, someone realized that just developing the interface for a website or for a piece of software should take into account much more than just what the user interacts with, Mm -hmm. more than just the look and feel, more than the navigation. User experience should be a a broader concept. So if you order something through e-commerce, for example, 
um, how long it takes for that item to arrive, the oh, circumstances okay. under which it arrives, uh, you know, how it gets to you, whether you're happy about it, whether you can feedback, that kind of thing. So uh, user experience has to do with that. It has to do with a person's mindset, their frame of mind while they're using a particular application. Um, there are things that users use while they're in a very gauge, engaged frame of mind. You know, gaming is a perfect example. Mm. When people uh, play a game, they're very completely in the moment. They are completely uh, immersed in that game. They don't think about anything else. They don't want to think about anything else. And they're generally very happy doing that. But if you have a car accident, for example, and you want to communicate with your insurance company, say, well, I've been a fender bender, you know, what do I do? Something like that. And if you have something that's very complicated to use, well, your frame of mind right. is not such that you're going to appreciate that. You want something that's simple, something that's responsive. So user experience has a lot to do with the greater experience to do with designing those software interfaces. That's fascinating. So yeah, I guess it would extend to, okay, who is going to be using this website? And 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 it's not always one person, I suppose, right? It could be people in this particular situation or looking for this kind of thing or feeling this way. And so all of that would be taken into account. That is a great point. So understanding your target market is a huge part of this and leads to something called personas. And uh, personas have been embraced now for the UX by the UX community now for, oh, I don't know, about 15, 20 years, but it goes way back to, to the marketing industry in the 1970s. So the idea was this. I think you're, you're probably familiar with the idea, as with most, most people, that marketing involves understanding your target market. Who is going to be using your product? Whatever it is, you know, whether it's a, a stove in your kitchen, whether it's a car, whether it's a chair, who is going to be using this? What do they like? In the old days, you would come up with a set of stats and, you know, you would say, okay, here's the demographic for the market segments. And usually you would identify about three market segments. Mm -hmm. Someone, and I've forgotten the person's name, came up with a very clever idea at one point to say, why don't we create a fictional character that rec represents this market segment? Mm. Give them a picture or a cartoon that tells <laughs> us what they look like. Come up with a fictional name. It can be an amusing name as long as it's a respectful name. Mm -hmm. Tell us about their personality. Tell us about their computer skills. Tell us about their level of expertise mm -hmm. with respect to the product that they're going to be using. Right. Personas to this day are still a little bit controversial. Some people don't really love them in the field of UX design. They think, well, you know, you're making up something here. This is fictional. And it doesn't have to be completely fictional, by the way. You can use perfectly good research, science to back them up. But, but there's a little bit of skepticism in some quarters. And um, I have to confess, I'm one of those people. I felt that back at the beginning. I thought, well, this seems a little bit fuzzy to me. But I've really come to embrace it. I really like it because it does a number of things. It, it can tell. So let's say you're developing a piece of software. Um, it gives something for your designers, for your marketing people, your developers, mm -hmm. your senior management, your venture capitalists. It gives them all something that they can understand about who this is for, who's going to buy it, what features it should have, how it should be branded, and um, whether or not this stands to make any money or whether or not it's, it's sustainable from a business point of view. Right. Um, it also gives it a very simple way to communicate it. So, like I said, we develop reports that explain the design of a piece of software. Well, you just plunk in the personas and somebody picks it up mm. and they have an immediate understanding of what you're talking about. <laughs> right, I mean, okay. it's, it's, it's absolutely instantaneous. Wow. So you've come around to personas. I have. Ah. And so how do those relate back to this lesson that you're sharing with us today? Okay. All right. So in this particular course, the students have two major projects. They do one in the first half, one in the second half. In the first half, they do a project um, that is some kind of a consumer app. And we give them, and usually it's done in a mobile version, that design involves them doing some research initially. We give them the idea. They do some brainstorming. They come up with some ideas. 
They develop the target market via personas. They come up with some concepts for the business model, okay. how it will be sustainable. That's the first researchy part. Let me just ask a quick question. So yeah. when they're developing this hypothetical c- consumer app, I suppose, right. you tell them what it's for or they have some choice in the matter of like what, what this app is going to do? We give them the basic idea. So that's like a seed. And then they have to take it and they are entitled to improve on it somewhat. And often students express some some skepticism. They'll say, oh, I'd never develop an app like this. It shouldn't be like that. It should be like this. And mm. so we can just say, and when I say we, um, it's usually me and I have uh, several excellent co-faculty teaching the course with me. But anyway, so we can say to them, okay, that's fine. You've got some good ideas. Run with those, but you've got to sell your team. Uh, don't take it too far away from the original idea. And why we do this, if you're curious, is uh, for academic integrity reasons. So we like to give them an idea okay. and have them develop it. hasn't been done before. It. You kind of... So exactly. what are some examples of consumer apps that you would, you know, invite them to <laughs> develop? Right. So it can be various things. It can be a game. It can be a piece of social media. Sometimes it's kind of um, a social awareness kind of app. So in terms of games, um, you know, I, I tend to assume that students, most students have played a game or like certain games. Mm. Um, that might be changing to some degree. A few years ago, you know, if I asked a, a group of students, who here is a gamer, most of their hands would go up. I would say 70%. Nowadays, when I ask them, the percentage seems to be smaller. And I'm wondering if that's a, an actual trend or if maybe they're just not... Maybe everyone's just struggling to survive and it, <laughs> work work in their, in their leisure hours. Yeah. Who knows? So um, I, I, I have to come up with ideas every semester, or at least every semester the course is offered for new things. So games that we've had have been Venusian Warfare. The, um, the premise is that Earth launches a probe into Venus's atmosphere and a noise these residents of Venus that Earthlings were not aware existed, and they immediately confront Earthlings. My immediate idea was that it would be like kind of like a shooter game, and I thought, well, I don't want to go down that route because who knows where that might go. So right. I said, okay, it's got to be economic warfare. So Earth and Venus go to, go to war um, economically. That was one idea. Okay, and so you'd give them this as a parameter, like here's this app, whatever it is you're developing, and then they can make slight adaptations, but not too many. Yeah, and what we ask for is a text-based game, because that's something that just about anybody can understand mm-hmm. and can develop relatively easily. But if, um, if a particular group, if they have people in the group who are good with a graphics tool, which is not unusual, because we have students like that especially going into one of the three programs that are getting this course, then they can make it a a graphics-based program. They can have little flying saucers, little Venusians, whatever they want. Cool. Uh, We've had other kinds of things. So uh, last semester we had uh, Save the Glass Sponge. um, (laughs) Save the Glass Sponge? Yeah, so this is something oriented around the environment. Um, and like I said, I have trouble coming up with ideas sometimes. I was listening to the CBC and they were talking about this glass sponge. And and for anybody who's interested, they should Google it. It's an amazing thing. It's a sponge that, as far as I know, is only found in the entire world off the coast of, of British Columbia. Ooh, okay. And it's a, it's a sponge that's literally made out of glass. It's made out of silicates. And they're not fired like the glass that we make, but they, you know, the crystals are grown. Huh. And the pictures are really quite beautiful. But being made out of glass, you might imagine that these are rather fragile yeah. creatures, right? <laughs> so the purpose of this app is to get students to develop um, some kind of uh, an app that will raise awareness and provide crowdfunding of, uh, capabilities. <laughs> I love it. For anything that, that crawls on the bottom of the ocean or, or you know, either plant-based or, or animal-based or whatever. Great. So that okay. was the idea. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So they have this as a parameter and this, you give this to them early on in the, in the semester. Yes. And then what's the rest of the lesson? Okay. So as part of that, they have to do some of the things that we've already talked about. They have to work in teams 
to come up with a features list. So they have to brainstorm, first of all, to think about how this particular application that they're designing would work. Mm -hmm. um, they come up with a features list, a preliminary features list. They come up with an idea for a business model, well, you know, various revenue streams, which can be all different kinds of things. And so it could be selling the app, it could be donations, it could be advertising, or it might not be an app that has direct revenue. Maybe it supports some other business function. Okay. And then they have to identify their target market, so their personas. So they have to do those three steps very early on, and they have to jump into it very quickly in order to meet the time guidelines to develop that first project. Mm. So you asked me about um, an in-class activity that I do with the class. So what I do is I take a parallel idea and I work through these kinds of activities with the students. So I have three that I go to. One is an astronomy app, one is a scuba diving app, and the other one is something I call a festival app that was mm -hmm. inspired by the Burning Man festival every year. So the, uh, the <laughs> idea of this is um, an app that allows people to develop small festivals or big festivals for that matter um, online. So the festivals themselves can be in person, they can be online, but you know, you have to book venues, then that could include halls, bars, restaurants, okay. hotels, that kind of thing. So whether it's the astronomy or scuba diving or Burning Man type festival, that's one of the things they have to like have yeah. accommodations. Okay. Exactly. So we pick out for each semester, we pick out one of those and I run through the exercises with them in class. Okay. And so I'll put it up on the projector. I'll say, okay, here's our idea. So you're doing, you know, save the sponge in your, in your, labs in a team, <laughs> but now we're going to do this, um, this festival app in class and we're going to go through the same steps. Mm. And so what I do is I ask them to come up with a preliminary features list and I get them to come up um, to the boards. And this was all spurred by an idea that uh, Catherine Brillinger gave me. So mm. I've had two um, of your consultants visit my classes. There was Catherine quite a few years ago, okay. and there was Nazreen in more mm -hmm. recent years after the pandemic started. And um, these kinds of interactive activities, I'd already just had a little bit of interaction in my classes, but not a lot. Okay. And Catherine was very big on that. And mm -hmm. I saw the value right away in this course. I mean, mm -hmm. it's really, it's huge because this is a kind of course where you get to talk about ideas, values, cultural sensitivities, yeah. although we've got to be a little bit careful about that. But we can talk about those kinds of things in this course and we can have um, interactive activities. So she said, you know, bring in a big pile of markers and let the students come up to the board mm -hmm. and put stuff on the board. And that's what I do. Cool. And it worked surprisingly well. I have to admit, I was, I was surprised Mm. that it worked as well as it did. I thought that students would be a little reticent because if you ask even a big amphitheater full of students a question, you'll get answers usually from a, a small subset of students and usually it will yeah. be regularly the same students. Yeah, and you're always grateful they're there, but you would sometimes like to hear from other folks too, right? <laughs> Absolutely. You want to hear from those other ones. And I thought, you know, it's going to be the same thing mm. in this kind of an environment. We'll ask them to come up, put something on the board, and it'll just be the same students. And it's not that, not that way. Mm -hmm. What happens is I, I ask them to form whatever teams they want so they can work in teams of three or 10 or 20. I don't care. And I do this in a big amphitheater. And so they'll turn around and they'll face each other. And they'll usually become quite engaged. They'll laugh, they'll talk. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is for them, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of humor, obviously, they find it amusing. I think they share some jokes, possibly at my expense, and <laughs> at the expense of the exercise along the way. But that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? No. Because it's got them engaged. It's got them laughing and talking. I'll say, okay, whenever you're ready, whenever you want, you've got 10 minutes, but whenever you're ready, go and put something on the board. 
And then usually after a few minutes, one student will go up. And, and then, they'll be adding to the board these things you said, like either something about target market or the other categories. Exactly. Okay. So for features lists, I'll say, okay, put at least one feature on the board. Right. Okay. Don't worry if somebody else has put it on. That's valuable. Uh, but just put up one thing. Or if you want to put up more, put up more than one. And then they'll just start going. And, you know, there might be a slow trickle at first. But over time, more and more will go up. And what's even more surprising is that after a while, I'll get some teams that will say, well, we put up one. Can we put up another one? Well, yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> so, okay, you can participate more. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Fine. absolutely. So that's worked out very well. And, and like I said, better than I'd hoped. So I do that for a preliminary features list. I do it again for revenue streams. Every team has to put up one possible revenue stream. And they come up, by the way, with some really interesting ideas. Some of them are things that I would expect. You know, like going back a number of years, I was doing the scuba diving app. And um, it might be it might seem like kind of an obvious answer now, but at that time it was it was a little bit new. Some teams said, well, let's have a fish recognition app, you know. Mm. So you've got your camera there, it connects to your mobile device. You know, so you've got something that basically does facial recognition on fish. On fish. And I'd a, want to use that if I were underwater and absolutely. meeting some new creatures. <laughs> That's right. Wow. And so um, so just so I can frame this, so this these kind of this mini one that you're doing as a whole class about scuba diving or um, astronomy or the festival. This is essentially, I think, kind of this gradual release of responsibility, right? You're kind of doing it as a much bigger group with you being much more hands on that's setting them up for success in their bigger group project, that they're going to be working more independently. Is that right? That's exactly right. Okay. Yeah. So we do it, and what we do in class is a little bit more narrow than what we're require, requiring from them for their projects. Uh, we do it quick and fast and in a very fun, mm -hmm. loose kind of way. And you're right. So now they've been exposed to it, and it breaks them into it very quickly. So I think for students, especially younger students, so most of our students are, are recently out of high school, you know, between the age of 18, early 20s, but we obviously, we get mature students as well. But for them to, for many of them anyway, to sit and look at a fairly lengthy document that explains the project and then figure out what they have to do mm -hmm. and then brainstorm and do it and document it is kind of an intimidating thing. You know, it's what writers, I think, refer to as, um, what do they call it, the, um, the intimidation of the blank page, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so we do it in class. We do it within the space of a few minutes. They're laughing. They're talking. They're putting stuff up on the board. They have an immediate understanding. And working together, too, right? I mean, that's, that's right. we hear a lot of faculty who have students who are kind of resistant to the idea of, of group work, right? And we know that it can yeah. be fraught, but I like this sort of lower stakes kind of fun <laughs> way in. And then they get used to working with each other and being like, oh, wait a second. If we are in a team, you've got this perspective that's different than mine. And we can bring them together and make something new and exciting. Exactly. And, you know, I wouldn't want to say that every course is the same and every course provides the same opportunities for, say, group work, for example. It might, it, it might not be appropriate for some classes, but the, the interactive activity, and again, the interactive activities, it might be tougher to do them in some courses, but you can usually think of something that they can do that will get them going. Mm -hmm. And I find, you know, like I carry over the same kind of idea to other parts of the course because we get into various areas. So sometimes it's just a kind of Socratic questioning that I'll do. Mm -hmm. And I, I find that that can break down into two areas. You might ask them something about something that's going on in the world topically, you know, uh, current affairs. If you do that, there might only be a few students in the class who will know what that's all about. Mm -hmm. um, so that's okay. You know, um, if, if you want to talk about something that's happening, uh, that's good. But you don't want to do too much of that because then there will be a whole lot of students in the class who will feel disengaged. 
So there are things that you can always ask students about that will involve an opinion. Right. You know, you can just explain a situation, give ask them for suggestions, and just about anybody can offer an opinion on it. So that can often stimulate conversation in these kinds of areas. For sure, yeah, and it's more inclusive too. And I yeah. love what you were saying too about the, the tactileness of it, right? If they were all sitting in their seats being, okay, type in your answers what you'd put for a target market, it wouldn't be the same. I think there's something like you're saying about the chairs shuffling and them actually walking to the board and putting it on that yeah. seems to inspire you I know, think so. engagement too. Yes. Well, Randall, I'm just conscious of our time here. Um, thank you for sharing this lesson. I'm sure lots of listeners are going to have many different things that they take away from it. Uh, before we wrap up today, I wonder if you have kind of a, uh, if you brought with you a, an interesting fact or something kind of quirky about you that your colleagues and students might not know <laughs> yet. Um, yeah, and there is something that's connected to this course. So like I said, one of the things that I have to do is to always come up with with ideas um, for for these projects, for the exams. And um, and one thing that maybe helps me with that is that I grew up with, with vintage science fiction and horror movies, so I have a real fondness for those. Mm -hmm. And I take a lot of inspiration from that for some of the ideas that we come up with, hence Venusian warfare, nice. for example. <laughs> of course. And uh, there was one thing, so I had to come up with an idea quickly one semester for a project, and I wanted it to be a game. And I wanted to use some kind of supernatural creature that had not been overused. You know, vampires, werewolves have been done to death, zombies. So I thought, okay, what's not been done? It's very hard to think of anything. I mean, there's even movies about le evil lepre leprechauns. Oh, my, really? <laughs> yeah. So I was listening to something on the CBC, and they talked about selkies, which are seal people in Norse mm -hmm. and Irish myth. You know, these seal people who come up on land, they shed, and they turn out to be extremely good marriage candidates. For some reason, humans are just, find these seal people to be irresistible after they drop off their seal skin. Mm. And uh, so what the humans do, quite cunningly, is they hide the seal skin, and the seal people can't go back to their own people. Mm. So I thought, okay, we'll do this. It'll be called Selkie Quest. This is going to be the thing. So the Selkie wants to get its seal skin back and go back to its people. So I was talking to one of my co-faculty, my co -faculty and I said pretty much the same thing I just said to you. I said, I've been having trouble coming up with new supernatural creatures for games. So I, I, I heard, you know, I heard this thing about Selkies, so I did this game. And he said, oh, yeah, my family and I just watched a movie about Selkies the other day. No so, way. Yep, there's this animated the film about the Selkie. Exactly. <laughs> So there you go. The challenges of trying to come up with ideas for projects. I like that. Well, and the students are going to, you know, they didn't realize they'd be learning about Selkies when they started this program. They did not. But it's, who knows, maybe most of them knew about Selkies already. You know, yeah, it's possible. If it, if it is out there. Well, thank you, Randall. <laughs> It's been a really stimulating conversation. Um, I have lots. I have lots more questions, as always. We could chat for another few hours, I'm sure. But um, you've offered a great deal. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for having me, Lauren. I really enjoyed this. Well, we have come to the end of another episode of My Favorite Lesson, a podcast hosted by Teaching and Learning at Conestoga College. You can find all episodes in this series and more by following Teaching and Learning at Conestoga on YouTube. You can also find this podcast on Spotify and other places you get your podcasts. If you subscribe, you'll be notified each time a new episode becomes available. For 24-7 support for all things teaching and learning related, please check out our Faculty Learning Hub at tlconestoga.ca. I'm Dr. Lauren Spring, reminding you, as the great Bell Hooks once said, that the classroom, with all its limitations, remains a location of possibility. Until next time.